Well, I'm Howard Green. Well, after a couple weeks of speculation, trading halts, and oblique news releases, a deal was finally announced that would see Viterra be taken over by Swiss commodities giant Glencore. And it is a blockbuster, $6.1 billion, $16.25 a share, with some chunks to be hived off to Agrium and Richardson International. That is the good news investors and traders were dealing with this morning. On the other side, BHP Billiton, the world's largest mining company, said China's steel production is slowing as the Chinese economy starts to shift focus from large building projects to consumers. It is these big picture looks at the economy and investment world that are the bread and butter for the hedge fund managers we've assembled today for our monthly hedgy panel. We are joined today by Frank Mayer, chairman of Vision Capital Corporation. Tim Lazarus, founder of Red Sky Capital, and Craig Michelle, portfolio manager with Macquarie Private Wealth. Good to have the three of you guys in with me today. Many thanks. Yes, pleasure. Coming in. Got to talk about the news of the day first of all. Viterra, and I'm going to throw it to you, uh, Craig, because you guys sold this morning. We sold out. We, um, yeah, we were watching the deal progress. I was on vacation last week and watching the deal progress on vacation, and it seemed to work for us. I mean, we made money on the trade. It was a long only position. Um, and we sold out this morning, sort of around 1590, stocks moving between 1584 and 1592. And we were happy with that, with that and we'll move on and we'll sell it over to the, uh, the M&A guys. <laughs> <laughs> so you didn't think to hold on for another bid? No, no, we, don't, no, we didn't. Didn't yeah. look like, there, there may be other bids come out. I mean, it's hard to say. We were happy with what we got and, uh, you know, we'll, we'll take the money elsewhere. Yeah, and, and the M&A guys? Well, what we did was, I think this was such a telegraph situation, the only question you had to determine was what the price was going to be and then what the spread that the stock was going to trade at, the rate of return between now and closing. So we had half a position on pre the announcement. Um, we've held that position. Uh, we're trying to determine right now whether this is going to close in Q3 calendar or Q3 fiscal. That can have a, an impact on your rate of return. I think it's uh, annualizing around 7% right now, which isn't enough for us to double down, if you will, at this point. 7% possible return on the arbitrage? On an annualized basis, yeah. yeah. If you look at it on an on a, on a absolute rate of return, it's probably something close to uh, less than 1% right now. But uh, we look at it on an annualized basis. If it can be 12%, then we'll uh, put a full position on. But what we're really waiting right now is to look at the circular. The circular is going to be full of information that's going to determine how this is going to trade over the next four or five months. Any view on it, Frank? None whatsoever. <laughs> Not yes. your area of interest. No. Nope. So what are you interested in in the market right now? What, what, what uh, macro uh, trend are you looking at? And then we'll, we'll dig down into the micro. Well, as you know, uh, the Vision Funds focus uh, on uh, publicly traded real estate companies in Canada. And uh, so what, in terms of the macro picture, what we're looking at is monetary policy. And it's, of course, led by Ben Bernanke at the Federal Reserve and their uh, predicting low interest rates uh, into uh, and through 2014. Do you believe that, given what's happening in the Treasury market? Well, listen, you know, every every year the you have a backup in uh, yields of uh, three, four, five times a year, and this what we're having right now is just another, in our view, another backup. We think low interest rates are here for a while, and in that environment, that's a very positive thing for the real estate sector here in Canada. So and, for it's, a while? Uh, and it's supported, by the way, by very strong real estate fundamentals. I mean, we have the best real estate markets that I've seen in 30 years. The best real estate market, you're talking about commercial real estate here. Commercial and, and the rental residential as well. So uh, when you talk about commercial, uh, very low re vacancy rates, lots of uh, U.S. Um, retailers coming up and so forth? Absolutely. Uh, you know, even in uh, Calgary, where there were concerns about overbuilding uh, not, to, not that long ago, all of a sudden the vacancy rate's down in the s low single digits. Uh, developers are actually uh, polishing off uh, plans to build new buildings. I noticed Brookfield the other day announced they acquired another half of the Herald Block, and they're going to be putting up 2.8 million square feet, if memory serves me correctly. Uh, the, market, the real estate markets are strong in Canada, and uh, so we put together favorable monetary policy, low interest rates with favorable real estate conditions. We believe the basic trend is up, though you will have corrections, and we're having a correction now. So, you know, I want to go back to uh, what Frank said about treasuries. He thinks this is just a, you know, a, a cycle of backing up. Do you agree with that, or do you think the bond bubble is bursting and that we're, you know, we're into a major shift now? Uh, from my standpoint, I mean, we, th there's opportunities in the bond market, and that's one part of our portfolio is to capitalize on, you know, um, discrepancies and disconnects within the bond market. So, 
you know, whatever happens with interest rates, I think, you know, over the long term, there's only one way for it to go. But currently, we're seeing an opportunity in the high yield space. We like the high yield space, but there's a disconnect occurring right now with this incredible rush into it. ETF buying is huge, and so the retail buying into the, into the high yield space is pretty significant as well. With that comes, you know, a trade which we like, and, and you know, as an example, we're, we're long Ford bonds, short-term Ford bonds, five years or less, 5% yield. Um, nice place to be. Could get a lift on a, on a Ford, Ford uptick in terms of ratings. And we're short the Ford long bonds, 2031s, same yield, it's 5%. So we're sort of square there, but it's 2031. So you're like a pairs trade within the same company. That's exactly right. So we're, we're eliminating the risk of Ford, if you will. We're neutralizing that, collecting 5% up here on the long side and short the 5% yield 2031, you know, 20 odd years out. Um, that is subject to your question, which is that interest rate risk. To me, it makes sense. It's in where we're actually winning on both sides of the trade. How does that kind of thing sound to you? How are you playing what's happening in, in rates in the bond market right now? Well, I think when rates, when the 10-year was below 2% and well below 2% for a period there, I, to me, that was a flight to quality. You know, there was no place to be investable in, in the world at that point. The, you, know, you had to go to the safest, biggest, most liquid market. That's what happened. People were fearful. You know, I think geopolitically, things are probably improving a little bit. The European situation seems to be push down the road a bit. And it doesn't surprise me that the 10 years now 240. The way to play it is look for companies that uh, do well in a rising interest rate environment. Perfect example of that, Manulife Financial. We just started putting a position on there. On, 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 on the, the debt on the side? Equity. No, on, on the, the equity. equity. Now, they're very sensitive to the 10-year. They're very sensitive to interest rates. Life insurance companies in general do very well in a rising interest rate environment. They've, of course, been hit because of that unhedged exposure on rates and equities. Right. So this is helping them. It's helping them significantly. If you look at the correlation between Manulife stock and the 10-year Treasury, it's very high. It's lagging right now. I think now is a great time to to build a position in Manulife. And by the way, I think they're a great company in general and very m much not liked by the market. What, what about on the debt side? Do you have any positions on the debt side? Uh, you know, our fund mostly does convertible arbitrage, so that's, you know, the rate uh, yield curve doesn't really impact some of the things that we're doing, but no, we're, we're not significantly focused on that. You're on buying that. the convertible bond when you short the same stock. That's correct, yeah. It's, yeah. For us, it's, uh, you know, it's a hedge trade. We're always looking for market neutral uh, exposure that's going to give us a nice uncorrelated return. You got one of those on right now? Uh, I don't think we do actually as it turns out. Uh, yeah. All right, we're going to take a quick break. We'll come back and continue our conversation, get into the nitty gritty with these hedgies right after this. Please stay with us. Okay, we're back with our trio of hedge fund managers today. Tim Lazarus of Red Sky Capital Management, Frank Mayer, Chairman of Vision Capital, and Craig Michelle of Macquarie Private Wealth. So, Frank, let me go back to you, and let's get into some specific names. You, you, you talked about the real estate sector and how wonderful it is here in Canada right now, commercial real estate. Uh, give me some names and why you like them and uh, why you pick them. Well, we, uh, we view the whole real estate sector as a smorgasbord and we select the best among them based upon a whole bunch of things, including real estate market conditions, uh, financial economic conditions, but we love underval undervalued uh, securities. Companies or REITs that are trading at a discount to their real estate value. And among the two top uh, on our list are Morgard Corporation and Main Street Equity. So Morgard. Go through that one first. Why that one in particular? Rather remarkable that this enterprise is undervalued because it is one of Canada's largest. In fact, according to our calculations, it's the eighth largest publicly traded real estate company in the, con in the country. And yet, it's trading around $90, and we believe its net asset value currently is just under $160, and within a year will be $180. I have a vague memory that there's a, a big shareholder who hasn't wanted to sell. Well, there's a, control, the there's a controlling shareholder who's a very smart man, Ray Sawy, to his credit, has created a wonderful vehicle. And that's something, in our view, that investors should be taken care of. It is one of our largest positions, and it reflects the undervaluation. And we have, every, we have faith that, ultimately, value will surface in, in the marketplace. That is the history of, at least during my career, it's always happened. And, and so what about the other one you mentioned? The other one, Main Street uh, is a, a less uh, well-known entity. It's, uh, it, it's, one can compare it to Boardwalk. It's uh, Boardwalk uh, REIT, with both Calgary-based, both in the apartment business, both Western-focused and particularly on Alberta. 
It's trading around $24, 24 and a quarter, and its net asset value, we believe, is 33. The street believes it's around 30. Trading at a discount, you're buying apartments at a discount, and there's always the, oppor the, uh, the possibility that Alberta will take flight uh, because, of course, the economy is so strong there and apartment rents will run up as they did in the, six, in the 2006 and 7. Are you short anything? Yes, we are. We're short Scott's REIT. And that's, the, that's the REIT that has all the Taco Bells and Kentucky Fried exactly, Chickens and so forth? Exactly. Exactly. They, they are way over distributing. Their, uh, the typical REIT in Canada pays out 90% of what analysts call adjusted cash flow, AFFO. It pays out 160%. They're in an untenable position, and they're going to have to uh, deal with their financial realities in a very short order. So, meaning cut the payout? Uh, that has to come. How that soon? How, how much time do they have? That's a very tough question to answer. Mm -hmm. uh, you follow real estate pretty closely. Uh, yeah. What would you add to that? I mean, what, what are you holding? What are you shorting? So forth. Um, I like what Frank says, and we own a lot of individual REITs as well, typically on the long side. Um, and you know, to your point, I'm, I'm interested in the apartment space. It's a viable place to be throughout Canada, I think. Taking it one step further, we actually utilize strategies which are involved in private real estate. So we're less interested in the asset growth. We're really interested in the yield, and we're really interested in removing ourselves from the volatility of the capital market. So through private mortgages in terms of pooled funds and through private um, apartment ownership in pooled funds again, you know, we're aiming for 7 to 9 percent. Um, year after year with really stable capital. And, and, so, and so then the nice thing about that, again, you know, exempt from the capital markets, you've got stability in terms of your return. Um, and it's, you know, it's, it's not about the asset growth, it's more about collecting the yield. And in fact, the yields are, it can be commensurate, they can rise commensurate with um, yields rising in Canada. Right? Unlike bond yields, they're going to come down, bond values are going to come down, yields can rise up, apartment rental rates will rise up with, with you know, um, the bond market. Are you short anything in the in the real estate no. sector? No. no? Um, how about you? What are you most intrigued with right now? Well, just to add to that first comment, we actually own Morgard as well, and this is a fantastic company. What I would what I would add to that is that I believe that they're spinning out a residential REIT, which could be a catalyst for that stock. It's a pretty sleepy name if you looked at it, but I think that that catalyst could realize some additional value in Morgard that. You know, I think from our perspective, we're always looking for an event. In terms of real estate, we, um, you know, we typically don't get involved too much. Our theme right now has been that the Canadian housing market uh, is, seems a little toppy to us. The uh, growth rates in terms of mortgage originations, um, I think the banks have been doing some things to really continue to stimulate one third of their business, which is you know, issuing like a lot of mortgages. 299 mortgages? 299 mortgages, low down payment mortgages. Um, is the OSFI note from yesterday a signal to you? I think it is. And I think if you talk to the bank CEOs, their one concern that they have is the, you know, the mortgage market in Canada and the pace at which it's growing. It's been 10 years of uh, nonstop price improvements in houses across Canada. And we're not just talking about Vancouver and Toronto. It's in all cities. They don't want to kill the golden goose, though. Absolutely not. But I would say that one way to play that, if you're, you know, from our perspective, is you can actually short companies that are involved in lending um, mortgages. That is the Canadian banks. There's also some, I won't call them subprime, but alternative lenders in the market. Uh, home capital as an example. These are companies that if the mortgage market does slow down and we anticipate that it will, their earnings will slow down and you could have some disappointments. So who are you short in that space? Well, we have one trade that I talk about quite a bit. I love it. It's uh, We're long Dundee Corp and short Bank of Nova Scotia. Dundee Corp is actually a holding company that has multiple assets, but one of its biggest assets is the shares of Bank of Nova Scotia that they acquired when they sold their wealth management division to them. Right now, Dundee Corp trades at about $24. The value of the Bank of Nova Scotia shares that they hold is about $22, and the, all the other public and private assets, including a great real estate portfolio, uh, adds up to $40. So you're getting basically a 40% discount to NAV uh, by holding Dundee Corp, and you're shorting 
the most volatile piece of it, which is the banks. And thematically, we don't like the Canadian banks right here anyway. So this it's is always a great risky trade. to short the Canadian banks, though. I mean, it's it's hard to sink a Canadian bank, well, and you got to pay the dividend as the guy who's shorting yeah, it. Yeah, I'm too. not suggesting. I'm not trying to be alarmist about Canadian banks. I just think that they're priced for perfection. The probability of them raising dividends and and you know beating on the upside right now is is quite low. So you're trying to close that gap. Uh, yeah, and we've seen it go as tight as 20% at some times. And w how it's going to get close, Howard, is the company is going to start buying back their stock again. And every time they do that, there's fewer shares outstanding. Our value as shareholders goes up. And uh, the last time they did, they, they purchased 10 million shares on a uh, special uh, course issuer bid. And I think they're about to do that probably within the next 60 days. That's, a, that's an interesting theme about the two companies that I mentioned. <laughs> Morgard and Main Street. They don't pay out big dividends, which of course is drawing a lot of people into the market these days in pursuit of yield. Mm -hmm. What they do is they re reinvest most of their cash flow in growing and they take a portion and buy back their shares. So the number of shares outstanding in each case is actually shrinking. So it's great for, for the shareholder. So you'd rather see buybacks than, um, than dividend increases? As it, depends a rule? On the, it depends on the circumstance. What about Apple? Uh, yesterday, I mean, and that of course led to all sorts of talk about the one and a quarter trillion dollars that's still on corporate balance sheets mm -hmm. that may be paid out in dividends. Yeah, or we, buybacks. yeah. In terms of that, you know, it's really interesting. You know, the world's going through this austerity program at the moment, where individuals are being mindful of that, governments are well and truly being mindful of it. Those that aren't, you know, that entity that is not, are you know, corporations. So we've we've got an interest right now in terms of that U.S. Um, the, the trade in the U.S. So there's a lot of, a lot of small and mid-cap sized companies in the U.S. which I think are undervalued, unrecognized, misinterpreted, things like that, with a lot of cash on the balance sheet and room to grow. You know, I think the U.S. is kind of an underlooked asset class, particularly for our, our sector anyways, for just, Canadians. Just look at J.P. Morgan. I mean, J.P. Morgan, the second that they had an opportunity to raise their dividend. Even before the Fed put out right. the <laughs> they, right. they raise their dividend. So yeah. I, think, I think there is tons of cash, particularly in large U.S you know, companies that are generating cash sitting to be, uh, you know, used either in dividend buybacks or, uh, or sorry, dividends or share buybacks. Mm -hmm. Got to take another break. We'll come back and conclude our conversation with these hedge fund managers right after this. Okay, we are back with our hedge fund panel, Tim Lazarus, Frank Mayer, and Craig Michelle. Uh, so uh, what else are you short? I love to know what people are short. Um, it's part of a paired trade, but we haven't discussed it in public, so I am afraid I can't share it with you. It's real estate? Yes. Yeah? I'm afraid I can't uh, go into it now. But uh, you poke them? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you were talking about the U.S. Right. And uh, telecom, is that of interest to you there? Yeah, I mean... Um Yes, it is. We, we, we've got a, a trade on right now in our U.S. portfolio, which is involved in the telecom sector on the infrastructure construction sort of build outside. So somewhat involved, but it's more of an infra infrastructure, you know, economic, um, you know, kind of growth story. And as I said, infrastructure construction company based on based in energy, utilities and telecom. Government um, contracts are in place there, and it's a it's a classic story in terms of being undervalued, unrecognized by the by the um, the street. Name again? Um, Matt Scott. Oh, geez, I forget. Mastec? Yeah, Mastec, that's right. Mastec. Yes, and, what, what's the ticker? <laughs> MTZ. MTZ in New York? Correct. Okay. We'll keep an eye on them. Maybe we can get the chart up. Um, uh, and and so, that's, so that's a situation where, you know, again, it's just one example of being unrecognized by the market and it's got room to move higher in a, in a, in a growing U.S. economy. This concept of being unrecognized in the market, I mean, you're interested in that, I know. I mean, that, that you like to see things where people aren't recognizing the current assets or you know hidden things in 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 the balance sheet where have Ab you seen those clues pop up over the years some of the best well, examples you, I, I mean i was an analyst for 35 years and so i knew companies uh, and reits pretty thoroughly and uh, you would find uh, uh find hidden value in all kinds of ways but recently ifrs uh, which is a new accounting uh uh, regime uh, has highlighted the valuations that uh, both of us talked about in in Morgard Corporation and in Main Street. Um, A different way area, of looking at the, the company. One area, I'll tell you one area where there's hidden value that 
uh, hasn't been brought to light, even under IFRS, is with respect to land, because land is perceived to be, by the accountants, to be inventory. And so you have uh, you know, uh, residential players on both sides of the border, and uh, the value of the land might be dramatically higher than its book value, but you don't see it on the, disclosed anywhere. Under IFRS, it might uh, no. It's not disclosed. That's precisely the point. It's not disclosed under IFRS. If you have an office building or a shopping center or an apartment building, it is disclosed. You have to disclose it now. Not land. So you have a publicly traded company like Melcor Developments. It owns both uh, income properties, and they do an IFRS valuation on it. But on the uh, on the uh, land side, and they own 9,500 acres, most of it in Alberta. Not a word. And so you would you would buy a so company theoretically we, that had well, that hidden a, hidden asset. Well, what we did when I was an analyst, we, what we did, we went out and actually valued all the land and came up with a valuation. And uh, you know, so the company says its book value under IFRS is worth twenty. We believe, uh, you know, I believe, I'm based upon the value work that I've done and my colleagues have done. It's worth in the range of twenty five dollars a share. Let's whip through a couple other ideas from you. Nike, you like Nike? We do. They're going to report this week. Again, everything we talk about tends to have some type of catalyst-driven event. But more importantly, um, you know, the theme around Nike is the improving consumer spending money in the United States in particular. Um, they've got some great growth, a fantastic balance sheet, tons of cash. They can do lots of things with it. They trade at lower multiples to, say, Under Armour or Lululemon. They're a brand that's recognized globally. Uh, and one thing that we discovered in the last three or four months is that they're going to revolutionize the running shoe segment of the market, which is the fastest growing portion of, of the athletic division, if you will. They've got a product coming out around the Olympics called Flyknit. Uh, we've done some look at it. It looks incredible. I think it's going to change people's perceptions on Nike from a running shoe manufacturer, if you will. Mm -hmm. And so you've got... You know, Summer Olympics, March Madness, all the athletics going on right now, you've got them reporting this week. And the stock, if you look at the chart, looks fantastic. And we're not technicians, but, you know, this is where people are putting money to work. And, again, valuation at about half of, of the value of those other two companies I mentioned. And is there a short that you'd put against it? Well, in the same space, I would never say short Lululemon because I think you could, you know, you could definitely uh, be carried out on that trade. This is a cult stock, but I mean, on a relative value basis, uh, you know, Lululemon at uh, 45 times earnings versus Nike at 19. A lot of hedge guys have you know, lost their yeah. yoga pants on yeah. uh, shorting. Uh. <laughs> we don't have that trade on for what it's worth. What we would do is, if you were to be like us, be long Nike, you could use the options market. It's got a very deep options market to protect yourself against the downside. So you could buy out of the money put. Last chance to reveal that short. <laughs> <laughs> Just between the four of us <laughs> and everybody who's watching. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but uh, good to have uh, the three of you guys with me today. Many thanks. Thanks, Tim Lazarus, Frank Mayer, and Craig Michelle. That's it for Headline. Any comments about the show, send us an email at headline at bnn.ca. Also, if you like, you can check out my Twitter page. You can find me at Howard Green BNN. And a new repeat time for Head. Headline, that is 10 p.m. Eastern, 7 p.m. Pacific. Also very early in the morning the next day. Thanks for watching. See you tomorrow.